morning and welcome to Northside Online. We're so glad to have you join us for the service today. Just a few things before we get started. I'd like to draw your attention to the Connect link where you can fill out and submit a connection card. That gives you the opportunity to ask questions and request information about anything and everything Northside related. If you have prayer requests, it lets our ministry staff know so that we can be praying for you. And finally, if you would like to get involved in serving at Northside, it's a great way to get more information on serving opportunities. If you've been thinking about paying us a visit on campus, we would love to see you here. We have services every Sunday morning at 8, 920, and 1040. The eight o'clock service is our classic service featuring hymns, while the 920 and 1040 services both offer contemporary worship. The Kids Corner offers opportunities for your birth through elementary aged kids at 920 and 1040, and the Forge Student Ministry has service for your middle and high schoolers at 920. It looks like it's time to get things started, so let's head to the Worship Center. Welcome to Northside Online. going it's great to have you here in the room with us great to have you online with us wherever you're at let's get to your feet come on it's time to praise our god let's sing i'm coming with a heart of worship i'm bringing in a brand new song i'm ready to see the unthinkable i'm ready for a miracle hearts praying for a fresh encounter souls looking to the living god i'm ready for a real revival oh holy spirit come like a flood like a fire holy spirit flow in this place fill our hearts holy spirit come like a flood like a fire holy spirit
we're so glad you're with us this morning. My name's Stephen. I'm one of the ministers here on staff. Whether you're in the room with us or you're joining us online, we're so glad you're here to worship with us. And we would love to stay connected with you. One of the ways you can do that is by filling out a connection card. You can get that on the church app, the website, or you can scan a QR code on the seat back in front of you. It lets us know of your presence here. You can share how we can be praying for you, how we can connect with you, and help you continue to grow in your spiritual walk. We also want to make sure you're aware of a free resource that you have if you're connected to Northside in any way, and that is Right Now Media. This is an app, a resource that's packed with thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, videos for devotions, uh, studies on marriage, finances, parenting, leadership, the list goes on. It's a great resource, so we hope you take the opportunity to get that downloaded. You can find information at the Connection Center on the church app or the website. You can click Media, and there's instructions on how you can get that downloaded on your phone. Thanks again for being with us. Let's continue to worship the King of Kings this morning.
thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified and were the whole earth echoing his eminence his name would burst from sea and sky from rivers to the mountain tops we'd hear Christ be magnified Oh, Christ be magnified Let His praise arise Christ be magnified in me Oh, Christ be magnified From the altar of Stand strong and worship you If it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too And I won't be fooled by feelings I hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway Into resurrection alive
and sisters, this is Adrian and Lula. Hi. We are here in Chiapas, in the southernmost state of Mexico. We are here with our evangelist Aldo Santos, with uh, the group, a group that came from Central Christian College of the Bible. Some of the the students there came to help with uh, this new building that was built about a year ago. Yes. If I'm correct, and we painted it on the outside, painted it on the inside, and we also provided uh, the money for the digging of the new pool that's going to be here because this is going to be a church building and also uh, church, the church camp for this area. Yes, we're very excited for that and we're here to worship with them. Today we're going to have a church service right now, but we want to talk to you about something important. Yes, and so as we prepare for uh, the communion today, I would like to read Colossians chapter 1 verses 3 to 6 and it says we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people the faith and the love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. And so because of God's grace today, we can take communion. We can take the Lord's Supper and we want you guys to consider and to prayerfully consider what God has done for all of us. And so we're super thankful that we can partake of the Lord's Supper, remembering what he has done for you and for me and for all these people in Southern Mexico. So with that in mind, I'd like to pray for our communion, uh, for the, the cup that represents Jesus' blood and uh, the cracker, which represents the body of Jesus uh, who gave himself up for us and for all these beautiful people that we are able to minister. And um, how, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. And we're thankful for churches uh, and people like you who love um, God enough to help us and support us. And so as we are doing things like this, we are also uh, partaking of, of this uh, together. And so we're, we're thankful for you guys. And let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the opportunity you give us to be here. We pray that uh, you would really help us understand your love and show this love to others. Thank you for Jesus giving himself willingly for us. And thank you for paying the price for our sins. Help us be better every day and that we might worship you uh, in a way that honors you, God. Thank you for your love. Please bless my brothers and sisters here in Warrensburg. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for everything.
Thanks again for worshiping with us this morning. If you haven't already done so, I'd ask you to take a moment to fill out the connection card. You can do that by using the church app, scanning the QR code in front of you. And while you're in the church app, you can also give your tithes and offerings uh, using those platforms as well. If you would prefer to give using cash or check, you can use the drop boxes at the back of this worship center. Worship center. We are so blessed with a generous uh, church body who um, is generous with their time, the skills that they've given him, and the finances. And we always encourage our church to use those not just within the walls of this building, but also um, outside of these walls, just like we financially support Southern Mexico Missions and Adrian and the ministry there. Uh, but also through our For the Burke campaign, where every month we have an intentional act of kindness where we encourage our church body uh, to be generous, to let the people in our community know that we are for them and that God is for them. And during the month of March, we are partnering with some of the social workers at the Warrensburg School District to help provide snacks to kids in need uh, during the school day. And so there are a couple ways you can do that. You can actually go to uh, the store and purchase snacks and drop them off here at the church during the week or next Sunday. And you can help help uh, by donating financially if you'd like to do that. If that's the method you choose, just be sure to select the For the Berg Fund when you uh, go to give. In the church app on the home screen, there's a section called For the Berg. You can click on there and there's a list of snacks that they're requesting that they use on a regular basis. So we hope you'll get involved in that way. Also in the church app, you'll find uh, information about all of our upcoming events and activities and ways that you can get connected and plugged in here at Northside. We're excited this coming weekend to host our annual women's retreat here at Northside. Uh, so if you've been thinking thinking that you need to register, I need to do that, I need to remember today is the day to do that because registration closes for planning purposes. So be sure to check out the church app and get signed up. We're excited to kick that off this Friday. They're asking you to bring a dessert to share as we kind of kick off the weekend together. You can find out more information about that in the church app or stopping by the Connection Center. Also next Sunday evening here in the worship center, we're hosting a night of worship. It's just a good time to get together as a body of believers and worship together. It it is family friendly events. We hope the whole family comes out to worship with us. And lastly, next Monday, March 28th, we're having an early diners event for those that are 60 and over. Meet at Heroes at five o'clock for a time of good food and fellowship and a chance to uh, connect with one another. You can find out more information about all of these events and more by checking out the church app or stopping by the Connection Center. If you're in the church app now, you can click Sunday worship at the very top and follow along with the sermon outline as our student minister, Nick Hatfield brings the message this morning titled Game Changer. Game Changer. This has been a phrase that's been tossed around and alluded to and given different definitions for a long time. But today I want us to all be on the same page. Today, I want us to be on the same page. Game changer refers to a new factor that comes into play and it changes the existing situation in a big way. Simply put, these are the moments, these are the things in our lives that redefine an outcome. And that is exactly what I hope and I've been praying will happen today. That there will be some heart change. For some of you, you will be introduced to a new factor that will be able to bring heart change and in turn, life change. Others of you, I have been praying that it will be this aha moment for you, where you kind of wake up. Now, those are some big hopes and dreams, I know, but I think we should probably go ahead and get started. We're going to be in Proverbs 4.23, and in this proverb alone, there's 14 game-changing words. Proverbs 4.23, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. If you were practically born in the pews or the chairs of the church, or if this is your first time here, this statement will be true for all of us in this room and those that are watching online. That this is true, that when our heart is changed, your desires change. And when your desires change, the course of your life is changed. It all starts with our hearts. It all starts there. And Proverbs 4.23 is referring to our spiritual heart not our physical heart, but the similarities between the two are too obvious to ignore. And so the first one, the physical heart, there's a lot of things that are important about our physical heart. Number one being, it helps you live. <laughs> it's kind of important for that. But with that, there's some other things that in our body we could probably do without. 
such as you could live without a limb as your arm or leg, right? That there's this movie, 127 Hours, where James Franco plays the role of a guy, a true story, where he's hiking and he gets stuck and he has to amputate his own arm. But not just that, but then he has to hike to safety from there. So an arm, negotiable. Then there was an NCAA division champion wrestler named Anthony Rubbles. Anthony Rubbles won the division championship in 2011. Now, I remember sitting on the couch at my best friend's house where they all were wrestlers in his family. And we're watching, and they were amazed. And so I was amazed too, because I know a lot about wrestling. Um, I don't know a lot about wrestling, but they were amazed, so therefore I was amazed. And he only had one leg. He was wrestling on another level. So limbs, totally negotiable. A heart, on the other hand, totally essential. It's not enough just to have a heart, though. The state of your heart matters. That if your heart is unhealthy or it's diseased, it will reveal itself with obvious symptoms. Some of those symptoms being a shortness of breath, a lack of energy, a tightness in the chest, and a numbness to feeling. You see, when those symptoms start showing up, we typically, hopefully, head to the doctor to figure out what's going on, to diagnose the problem. But there's some very complex things that happen in our bodies. That, but there's some things that we can kind of insinuate, that we can kind of guess will happen. Take, for instance, that if you eat bacon as if it's an Olympic event in copious amounts, you can kind of guess that you're going to go visit a doctor very soon, or maybe even worse. You see, the truth is the doctor can only do so much, though. There comes a point where we have to get involved, where we have to do something where we have to make that lifestyle change from maybe eating three pounds of bacon a week to maybe one pound of bacon a week, right? We have to make the lifestyle changes. And then the same is true for our spiritual heart, that at some point we have to take action by guarding our heart, that we have to look into our life and what is causing us to be more like Christ, to act more like Christ, to think more like Christ, and what isn't and guard our heart from those. Just like our physical heart, our spiritual heart will show symptoms as well. That you won't have a shortness of breath, but you will have a shortness of love. That you won't lack energy, but you will lack compassion. You won't be, there won't be a tightness in your chest, but instead it'll be a tightness of your generosity. And you won't have a physical numbness, but you will be numb to God's presence. See, if you really want to evaluate your spiritual condition of your heart, just wait until something happens that isn't the way it was supposed to happen. (laughs) What symptoms are revealed when the pressure builds up, when pain shows up? What symptoms are revealed? For me, the symptoms of my heart and the condition of my spiritual heart shows up when I'm under pressure or when things don't go my way. (laughs) In the morning, I love to start my day easy. Wake up subtly to an alarm clock, not a blaring alarm clock, okay? I don't know how you Neanderthals can wake up to a blaring alarm clock, but I subtly wake up and I get my day going and get ready. I go into the kitchen, maybe brew if I'm dreaming, a naturally processed Ethiopian coffee, very fancy. But then I walk into my living room and I just kind of bask in the sun coming in my front windows. It's good morning. But then I have to get in my car. Then I get in my car. Maybe you can relate that I have patience for people, even those people that come up to a roundabout and have never seen a roundabout in their life. I have patience for those people. I do. I even have patience for those people that drive 45 or 50 down Highway 13 into town. I have patience for those people. But my patience typically runs out right about the overpass of 50 Highway when I'm in the turning lane trying to head eastbound on Highway 50. Now, it's, it's a yield light, but a lot of people see it as a stoplight because they stop for far too long. That they maybe yield for someone coming out of Starbucks, which is another block down, and they're like, oh, they're possibly coming this way, so I'm going to yield for them. <laughs> now, I've only honked my horn a handful of times, but every time I come to this intersection, it makes me want to add to that count. But once I'm past that intersection, and I'm on my way, and I make it to church, I'm my happy-go-lucky self again. No more rage monster driving me. (laughs) But where did that come from? Where did that that rage, that anger come from? It came from my heart. That I have some rage or anger plaque built up on my heart. 
And that plaque does two things. One is slows down my love for others and in turn slows down my spiritual growth. See, when Jesus spoke of heart-changing, game-changing things, we're going to pick up in Matthew 15, 1 through 2. Matthew 15, 1 through 2. Some Pharisees and teachers of the religious law now arrived from Jerusalem to see Jesus. They asked him, why do your disciples disobey our age-old tradition? For they ignore the tradition of ceremonial hand-washing before they eat. Now the Pharisees are the religious leaders that distinguish themselves by strict observation of the religious law. So they were trying to do the right things. But in this moment, they were trying to catch Jesus in doing something that they could use to discredit him. Now, Jesus didn't break any of God's laws. Hear that. But instead, he broke their human laws that they had put up into place. Think of it like this. That if God's law is this right here, then these Pharisees have set up speed bumps of traditions, stop signs of rituals, before people even had the option or the choice to break God's law. Now they meant well, right? They didn't want people to break God's law. But in their arrogance, they raised those things that they put into place to the same level of importance as God's law. Fortunately, this is still happening today. That whenever I was a teenager, I remember learning that Christians shouldn't play cards. Now this came to me, and I was told this whenever I was dealing some hands to my buddies in the church parking lot. <laughs> that we were getting ready to play some card games, and we were waiting for the church van to come and pick us up and take us to church camp. And a lady came out of the church and said, you know, Christians shouldn't play cards. It leads to gambling. So solitaire, shouldn't play that. That's a bad game. Go fish, that's demonic. And Uno, don't even get her started on Uno, okay? <laughs> but the Pharisees here, the Pharisees here had a question about hand washing. The Old Testament, God instructed the priest to be ceremonially clean. Now this meant that they had to not just wash their hands, but they had to wash their hands from the tips of their fingers to the very ends of their elbows. This was to make sure that they were clean, that whatever they took and they ate then went into their body did not defile them. It wasn't unclean. So as the priest did this, then as time went on, the Pharisees decided, you know what? Everyone should do this. It should be a family affair. It shouldn't be just the priest doing this, but everyone should be doing this. And this is where Jesus says, people, you're missing the point. You're missing the big picture. You're more worried about clean hands than you are about clean hearts. Look what Jesus says in verse 7 to 9. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship is a farce, or like slapstick comedy. It's ridiculous. For they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. The word hypocrite here has its origin in Greek theater. It's describing a character that would have a mask on, that would conceal its identity as the show goes on. See, this isn't what Jesus is looking for. He's not looking for a show. He's looking for so much more. But then Jesus gets to their hand-washing protest here in verse 17. Anything you eat passes through the stomach and then goes into the sewer. Now Jesus is addressing a very basic bodily function here. You eat something, it eliminates itself, right? Now there's some great potential for some potty humor, but I would never squat so low. So, <laughs> verse 18. But the words you speak, but the words you speak come from the heart, and that is what defiles you. See, Jesus addressed a very ideal thing here, that your dirty hands don't defile you. That's, you're missing it. But it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you. But the more important thing is, where does it come from? Where does your words come from? It comes from your heart. And that right there is our game changer today. Our game changer. What comes out of your mouth starts and grows from our heart. Whenever you say something mean, rude, crude, whatever, whenever we say something that we didn't really mean, we say, oh, I didn't mean to say that. What the closer to the answer of the truth is that we didn't mean to say that out loud. See, we can fool others all day long, but God will never be fooled by our masks. It says so in Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes. He is the one whom we are accountable. 
So God sees it all. He sees my heart. He sees your heart. And they're laid out bare, exposed for him to see. No hiding in all their entirety. But Jesus picks up in verse 19. From the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands will never defile you. It's quite the list that Jesus goes on. That from your heart comes evil thoughts. Murder flows from the anger stored in our hearts. That adultery, sexual immorality flows from the lust stored in our hearts. That theft flows from the greed in our hearts and lying flows from the deception in our hearts. And the slander comes from the jealousy in our hearts. See, it's very clear here that Jesus teaches that the game changer is our heart. It's not our mind. It's not what we say. It's not our words. But it's our heart. Our heart is the game changer. Now, I'd want you to know that God is not just a glorified etiquette instructor. That God's not looking for behavior modification. He's looking for so much more. He's not looking to change you from the outside in. He's looking to change you from the inside out. We go on to Matthew 23, 25 through 28. This is where Jesus gets a little hot. (laughs) He gets a little heated here. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and Pharisees, hypocrites, For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup of the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup of the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of the religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are like the whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurities." I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like second grade Sunday school Jesus that I remember on the felt boards. This is serious Jesus. This is Jesus that knows how to kick tail and take names. He's not messing around. In biblical times, the tombs were regularly cleaned on the outside. They were beautiful. They were ornate. They were, they were something that you couldn't pass by without actually glancing at because they shimmered in the sun. And the religious leaders were the same. That you couldn't pass by without looking at them and say, oh, they probably got it all together. They look good on the outside. But on the inside, they missed it. They're full of gross. They were dead. See, they were in need of a Jesus beatdown, right? (laughs) But why was Jesus so worked up about these heart issues? Why was he so worked up? Well, I think he knew that unclean hearts wreak havoc in our lives and in our relationships. That, let's kick it back to us. What about us? What about our human heart? Is there any hope for our heart? Let's look at Ezekiel 36, 26. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put in a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. See, in this verse, Ezekiel is writing to the nation of Israel that they are in exile. They're no longer in the land that was promised to them. But Ezekiel is saying, look forward. Look to the capabilities and the character of the God that we serve and we love. And this idea and theology is written all over the New Testament. A new transformed heart. That is what God does. That is what God gives us and that is what the business that God is in of changing hearts and changing lives. So yes, I would say yes, there is hope for the human heart. Because when your heart is changed, your desires change. And when your desires change, the course of your life is changed. But here's the key. You alone can't do it. You alone cannot change your heart. You will not, will never, cannot change your heart by yourself. God does. God does. He does it so in cooperation with the Son, the Spirit, and get this, even us. We are a part of that also. See, it's teamwork. It's a partnership. It's a process that needs to happen. Galatians 4, 6, and because we are his children, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. 
Now, God's Spirit is at work within you, confirming this relationship that's happening, that you have been a part of God's family. This holy, divine relationship is happening within us. That God's saying, look, you're a part of my family. I look out for my own. (laughs) That I got this. I got the heart surgery. All I need is you to do your part. I need you to do your part. So, I'm a man. I'm very practical. If there's a problem, I like to know how to solve it. So let's get practical. There's three things that we can do to do our part in this. And that is to give, forgive, and celebrate. Give, forgive, and celebrate. Today's world, it's so easy to get caught up in the newest, greatest thing, right? That jealousy is really easy to catch. That there's new tech coming out. There's new houses being built. There's new cars rolling off the factory. That it's so easy for jealousy to creep into our hearts. That's where we need to be on guard. That we need to actively guard our hearts. But as we pray, we say, God, please take this jealousy from my heart. I know how corrosive and how damaging it can be to my relationships. In response, I think God says, I know. I'm working on it. I'm working on your heart. But I need you to do something. I need you to do your part. Go celebrate that guy's new car, that lady's new house, that new tech that that friend has. Celebrate with them this God-given gift that they have received. Celebrate with them. Give them a compliment about it. But the temptation for us is to say, well, it wouldn't come from the heart. It wouldn't be genuine. And that's where God says, I know. Your heart has been diseased, riddled with sin for far too long. I'm working on it. It's a process. I'm working on it. But I need you to partner with me to make this heart change that's happening inside become outside. We need to look for opportunities to give, forgive, and celebrate to make it a daily exercise, to turn them into routines that we can cooperate with what the Holy Spirit is doing on the inside, outside. See, think of it this way, that God will do what's possible for him. All he asks is that we do what's possible for us. God will do what's possible for him if we do what's possible for us. Now, we know we can't change our heart spiritually. We know that. But God can't steer a parked car. You can't be sitting there just waiting for it to happen. You have to be a part of the process, a part of what's going on. For change to happen, we have to actively be listening to the Spirit's prompting and leading for our lives. Ephesians 3, 17, then Christ will make his home in our hearts, get this, as you trust him. As you trust in him, that he's promised that you don't have to do it by yourself. That he has given us this Holy Spirit that can come and dwell within us, that can prompt us to lead us to say the things we're supposed to say, to do the things we're supposed to do, to go to places we're supposed to go. It's not all on you. But not just that, but we are prompted to have a heart more aligned with God. We also have the chance and opportunity to be with Christ-centered people that are actively looking at their heart's condition in small groups or community groups that we offer here at Northside that you can see real life change, real heart change happening up close and personal with your friends and neighbors. But not just that, we also have the word. We have the word that we can go to and actually know, not guess, know exactly what God is calling for us to do. And finally, we have this community here. We have this church that we can gather and to be a part of God's body. So there are many opportunities that we can do our part in this heart change. Because when your heart is changed, your desires change. When your desires change, the course of your life is changed. See, no doctor can force you to get that surgery. No doctor can force you to get your heart into shape. The same is true for our Heavenly Father. He is not forcing himself into a relationship with us. He's given us free will, the chance to choose But like we said, uh, well, not right now, Jesus. That's not the answer. Maybe whenever I get my life together. You (laughs) come to Jesus, then get your life together. He helps you do that. See, there's no in-between. There's no fence to be sat on. You either say yes or you say no. But God is cheering us on. God is cheering us on. After all, he created us. He knows what's best for us. 
And he knows that a healthy, growing, spiritual, God-infused heart is what will lead to a life that we can never fathom for ourselves. So this week, I want to encourage you to talk to God about this partnership, about confessing your sins of your heart where you need to confess. But not just that, but also commit to doing your part in this heart change to happen. But I pray that you don't just keep it to yourself in between God. That I pray that you can come and you can talk to us here at Northside, that we are here to help you with that. We would love to help you figure out what is your next step? What is Christ calling you to do next? Because following Jesus is a process. It's a partnership. Then I hope that you will commit to it because it has the chance to change the course of your life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for this time that we could dive into your scripture. God, I pray that as we can choose to allow you to come into our hearts and to have real life change happen. God, we know that you are the only one that can make that change happen in our hearts. But God, we have a part to play in that change. I pray that as we go out this week, that we can find ways to give, forgive, and celebrate. That we would allow your spirits prompting in our life. God, we thank you for all you are and all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nick, for that challenge this morning. I want to let you know that one of our elders, Tim Cowan, and his wife, Lisa, will be up front here after the service. If you'd like to talk with them, if you'd like someone to pray over you, Tim and Lisa would love the opportunity um, to connect with you in that way. Also want to let you know that any time during the week, literally any time during the week, you can reach out to our ministry staff through our text and church number, which is 660-570-7989. Those messages get to our ministry staff, and we are able to respond to those as necessary. I want to remind you to check out the Connection Center and the church app for upcoming events. Make sure you get registered and signed up for those. And as we wrap up the service this morning and prepare for our women's retreat, if you're able to stick around and help us stack chairs, we would greatly appreciate that. We stack them in stacks of six. The pocket chairs all go in stacks and the non-pocket chairs go in go in stacks of six. After you stack them, you can just leave them where they lay. We'll work on getting the lights pulled up and the chairs moved where they need to afterwards. So if you're able to stick around and help with that, we would greatly appreciate it. Hey, thanks again for being here. We hope you have a great week. You are dismissed.